Welcome to our second lecture on narrative and film. We're looking at chapter two of the textbook, looking at movies, an introduction to film. Principles of film form. This course is largely interested in the ideas of film formalism because I think we learn the grammar of stories through the grammar of written language and then we just port that over to our interpretations of film and film has its own set it has its own grammar it has its own language as we discussed uh, last time in regards to Raiders of the Lost Ark and I think it's fascinating to get to take a look at a movie like Little Women which is a celebrated work of written literature. The book by Louisa May Alcott is a classic and a favorite. It's beloved. And this uh, Little Women has been made into uh, a movie something like seven times, I believe. And uh, so, you know, this is also a favorite of cinema. And it's, it, to me, it's, it, it's, it's an opportunity when we have an adaptation, especially a really good adaptation, and we might say, well, you know, what, what's the definition of a good adaptation? That's a whole other course. But let's just understand that an adaptation can be good even if it doesn't have strong fidelity to its source text. What I'm saying is that the end result, the end piece of art, might be really good even if it isn't exactly or even remotely like the source material that it is derived from. Uh, Little Women, this particular version was made in 2019. Uh, the director was Greta Gerwig. And uh, she'd worked on uh, mostly the, the, what uh, you find in her, in her, her career is that she, she's worked on this other coming-of-age movie, Lady Bird, which was critically praised. Uh, Wikipedia will tell you that she was involved in, I didn't even know that this was a thing, Mumblecore Films, which are apparently movies that involve naturalistic acting and dialogue. Um, so Gerwig's an interesting choice uh, for the director of a period adaptation of a classic like Little Women. She, I don't think she would be the first person that would come to mind when someone's saying, hey, let's do a period movie and let's do Little Women. Uh, Greta Gerwig might not have been the first director that comes to mind. But let's jump back to the idea of form for a little while here so that we understand what it is that we mean when we talk about form. So you've got content. And in this particular instance, which is from uh, the textbook, you've got the human figure. In the first instance, ostensibly male, right? Well, not ostensibly male. It's obviously male. Um, so that's the content of that particular image. And then the, in the second one, we could say that's still uh, a person, still a human, and, and is therefore potentially the same content as the first image. And the third image, uh, even though it's now this almost like two-dimensional, three-dimensional sculpture, uh, you now have, uh, there, there are fewer details. And so... Um, this is your textbook's way of talking about the difference between content and form, and I'm not particularly thrilled with it because what we have here are three statues. So the form hasn't really changed. Now, somebody might say, well, the way in which the statues are being done is different from image to image. In the first one, we have this uh, Renaissance classical-looking statue with lots of detail. In the second... Uh, we have less detail, but there's still depth. And in the third, we've lost that depth entirely. But that is not the same as, as, as a difference in form, an entire difference in form. I think a better example would be to take what we did last week, Raiders of the Lost Ark, <clears throat> and to look at, you know, we've got the film, the original, and then we've got the Atari video game from the 1980s, and we've got the comic book from the 1980s, and those are different forms. Uh, the film is something that we see, it, uh, to use Linda Hutchins' terminology for this, this is the mode of engagement that she calls showing. And then the game is the mode of engagement that she calls interaction and I call playing. And the comic book might be said to be a mix of showing and telling, but it's a book. Uh, and you can get a novelization, too, of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that would be the same content as the film, but in a different form. 
in a different means by which the subject is expressed and experienced, right? So the content is the subject of an artwork, what it's about, and the form is the mean by which the subject is expressed and experienced, that is, how it is presented. And we get the same sort of thing going on with Little Women. We have the opportunity to uh, experience the same content, but in a different form. The content of Louisa May Alcott's novel, Little Women, is, and I've never read the book, so I don't know how close, closely the, the, the film adheres to the book. I don't know what level of fidelity it's working at. And frankly, I don't care because to assess the film, I don't need to know the book at all. Knowing whether or not this is a good movie, and some people may, will, may disagree with me on this, I don't need to know anything about the book to know whether or not this is a good movie. To know whether or not this film works as art, I don't need to know about the book. But I think it's instructive to talk about the idea of the form of the novel and the form of the film, and to understand that they are different things, but that they can present the same content to us. However, in those forms being different, the way in which that content is given to us will change. Now, your textbook talks about form and expectation. And we can have expectations about the content of Little Women based upon not only the novel, the original novel, but a really successful adaptation. So there was a very successful adaptation made in the 1990s, and Winona Ryder was in it, uh, Susan Sarandon was in it, and it, it, it did very well. Uh, and, and there are a lot of people who have strong nostalgic attachments to Little Women. And those nostalgic attachments, either to, the, to uh, Louisa May Alcott's book or to the 1990s film, can create a sense of expectation that can, we have to say, at least affect, if not skew, our perception of the next adaptation that comes along. Now, this idea of form and expectation is not just about adaptation. It's just that I think that looking at a particular adaptation clarifies the ideas about content and form, and form and expectation. Because the kind of expectation that we have for a film adaptation of a book is, I think, more engaging than, than genre expectations. Like We have expectations from certain genres. If I go to see a comedy, I expect to laugh. If I go to see a romance, I probably expect to fall in love with one of the characters. Um, and if that isn't satisfied in perfect ways, I just might say, well, that wasn't a very good romance or it wasn't a very good comedy. But you ask people if they have strong expectations about an adaptation, and that is a whole different thing. They use uh, this really value-laden language. It was an aberration. They ruined my childhood, that sort of thing. Uh, so I think that that's why I'm using uh, Little Women. But it's this idea of form and expectation is not endemic to... Uh, adaptations. You can get it with other uh, other concepts in film. So film form. Let's talk about film as a form. Uh, I th One of the things we talked about with Raiders of the Lost Ark is the idea that cinematic language is virtually invisible to us because it mirrors reality in many ways so well. And consequently, we are largely unaware of the idea stated here, which is that movies are highly organized and are deliberately assembled and sculpted by filmmakers. They don't arbitrarily happen. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to make movies with a beta camera. Uh, it was a video camera. And we would just get some friends together and we would make a movie. We would plant the camera in a place and then we would all like pick up some fake swords or something like that. And then we'd all run into the, into the frame and we'd fight with each other for a while and we think man that was super cool and then we go take a look at what we filmed and be really disappointed because we hadn't taken the time to think about what camera angles needed to happen really we should have had one of us being the cameraman I should have been a cameraman but I always wanted to be in the action and I, I didn't 
organize what I was doing. I did not deliberately assemble or sculpt much of the film that I made, made as a teenager. And every now and again, I'd put the camera exactly where it needed to be, and I'd be like, wow, that was an amazing shot. How did that happen? And I, and I couldn't analyze what had gone on. I couldn't analyze that a low angle might have a different emotional impact than a high angle. So movies are highly organized and deliberately assembled works of art made by filmmakers. And we can see this in the opening sequences of the film where we're introduced to the four women who make up the little women of the title. We're introduced to the March sisters. We're introduced to Joe, who's played by Saoirse Ronan. And uh, Saoirse Ronan, as with all of these actresses, these are, these are young up-and-comers. They're, they're mainly in their 20s. Emma Watson is now 30, but mainly in their 20s. And with a really strong pedigree, these weren't unknowns, uh, even though a lot of people might not know uh, the last in the sequence, Beth, Eliza, uh, played by Eliza Scanlon. Uh, she has had critical acclaim for her work on an HBO series called Sharp Objects. And then we've got Meg, uh, played by Emma Watson. And uh, many people will know Emma Watson. She's uh, like basically a household name. She played Hermione in the Harry Potter series, and she played Belle in Beauty and the Beast, among many other roles. And uh, and and it's it's fascinating to see Emma Watson playing the character that she is in this movie, especially when you know her public persona. And I think it's fabulous what she does in this movie, although there were some critics who said mostly all she did was laugh and smile. And I'm like, yeah, that's sort of the character. Um, but then we also have Florence Pugh playing Amy. And I'm going to just go ahead and admit I love Florence Pugh as Amy. I absolutely fell in love with Amy in this movie. Joe is awesome. I know Joe is the protagonist. And, and Greta Gerwig has said that um, jo she, she really identifies with Joe. But for me, uh, Florence Pugh playing Amy, she, she had my heart so many times through the movie, uh, even when she's, she's playing a young woman. And that's, that's something that's fascinating about this film is the way that these actors, actresses shift back and forth between the young and old versions of themselves. And this is something that Greta Gerwig talks about in the process of, of creating this, this adaptation was that there were two books basically of Little Women. It's often all packaged together, but there are two books, and one is the women as, as young women, and the other is as adults eight years later. And she plays with the structure, and we're going to talk about this some more in just a little bit. She plays with the structure of this story to craft the narrative that she's creating here. And in doing so, she has these jumps, these temporal jumps, back and forth between the young versions of these women and their adult uh, futures uh, so that the movie acts as, as a, as a, you know, we begin with the adult versions and then shift into memory to recall who they had been when they were young. And uh, for my money, I think Florence Pugh does the best job of being younger. She plays young and we might say immature so well, especially when you contrast who she becomes towards, I don't want to say towards the end of the film because I can't say that as I'm going to reveal in some upcoming slides, but um, the way that we get, we, we're aware of how these films are articulated in this very carefully crafted way uh, is, is shown through those those ideas of cinematic language is what we called it last week. This week, uh, your textbook refers to it as elemental systems, mise-en-scene, sound, narrative, editing, and others. Uh, we're going to include cinematography in our discussion today in the others. And that those constitute a movie's overall form. And when people talk about like whether a movie is successful or not, they'll often just talk about the director. Like, I can't believe Zack Snyder is such a terrible director because... And it might not have been Zack Snyder's fault at all. It might have been the, the editor's fault. It might have been the cinematographer. The director can have a vision. And if they don't have a team who can give them the mise-en-scene that they want, who can give them the sound design that they want, then sometimes that movie falls apart. What's amazing to me about 
Little Women is how cohesive it is and how well it holds together despite being a non-linear narrative. So we're going to be talking about those those ideas again. And that might feel a little bit like wash, rinse, repeat. Didn't we do this already? Yeah, we did. But I'm one of the goals of this course is for me to hammer film language into your minds. Because once you know film language, you can read a film in ways that are, I think, superior. As I was reviewing the movie in preparation for this lecture... I was once again overwhelmed emotionally, not only by what was happening in the movie, but in the way that the movie mediated it to me, mediated this narrative. Because you can have the best story ever, and if you can't put it on film, just like my friends and I fighting in front of the camera, if you can't put that on film in a way that mediates that information to your viewer in a compelling way, then it's not a very good film. It might be a great story, but it's not a very good film. Because as your textbook says, uh, motion pictures through the camera, they don't simply re record the space in front of the camera. There is a deliberate determination and control of our perceptions of cinematic space. So there's always something very carefully, uh, something very carefully orchestrated going on with filmmaking. Different levels of it, different levels of success. Again, we, we, we talk about mise-en-scene, the idea that encompasses production design and costuming. And I love how at the, as, as, as the movie is introducing these young women to us, it tells us so much about who they are through, the, through film language. And I'm going to use uh, Meg, uh, Emma Watson's introductory moment as an example of, of mise-en-scene, we see her at the shop with her friend who is of greater financial means than she is. And they're talking about buying a dress. And she has this look on her face where she's like, ah, I can't really afford this. Even though she's wearing something that looks pretty sharp. It looks like there, there was money involved in what she's wearing in the initial frame when she's talking in the store. And then we see her at home and we see how tiny the home is. We get this establishing shot that shows us how small the home is. We see the laundry out on the line. We see her hugging and loving her children. But then we see her sitting and we get a close-up that shows us what she wears at home. And it is not as opulent as the initial piece of costuming. And we're getting tons of information visually through the camera lens, but that's absolutely mise-en-scene at work. That's absolutely production design. Even if that house wasn't built specifically for this movie, the production crew went and found one that was going to work. And they said that that little house right there is going to communicate Meg's situation. That is mise-en-scene. And the costuming is mise-en-scene. Meg wants to be in society in the way that this you know, this friend of hers with with this you know who's who's more affluent than she is but she can't be and then we have sound sound through dialogue music ambiance and effect tracks and i love the way that sound is used throughout this movie as a beautiful soundtrack it was nominated for best original score by alexandra desplat and um that is certainly a level at which this film is is gorgeous and beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. But there's also something really cool in the sequence where Joe and Lori meet for the first time. And he says, will you dance with me? And she says, well, there's something wrong. I burned my dress. And he says, well, I think we can do something about that. And they go outside. The music that we hear in that sequence is not how we would hear it if we were actually standing outside a building in the way that they are. The music remains as present in the film as it does in the interior shots, as it does in the exterior shots of Laurie and Joe dancing out on the veranda. And the way that sound is used there, we don't even really hear their feet on the floorboards. It's as though they're caught up in the music. And sometimes that's what a movie will do, is that it will cheat sound not to replicate what things will really sound like. And we had an extensive conversation 
in our class about the way in which sound was used in Raiders of the Lost Ark in this hyperbolic way where all the gunshots and the punches are just thunderous. They don't, they don't mirror what real punches and real gunshots sound like. Um, sound insofar as dialogue. Greta Gerwig loves dialogue to sound natural. And um, the actors have talked about how when, uh, and I, I believe it was uh, Florence Pugh actually talks about how they would go to do a take and Greta Gerwig, the director, would not be looking at the camera monitor. Instead, she'd just be listening to the dialogue. Because you have to remember that there are so many scenes in this movie where we have four really extraordinary actresses all talking over each other. And the screenplay was written in that way. Uh, Saoirse, Saoirse Ronan talks about how the, the, the screenplay was written a little bit, she says, more like, like a stage play. And the idea was to go, okay, these are all the things that need to come out in this scene, but you don't have to wait to say them. You have to try to get them in there. And this is what Greta Gerwig said. Um, she wanted it to sound like how sisters really talk, where it's like shouting over each other. And for a sound editor, that's a nightmare. That's an absolute nightmare. Even if the, the, all of the voices were re-recorded after production and then mixed. And this will happen quite often, actually. The actors go in and they re-record their lines to sync up, that they dub their own uh, vocals because there was too much noise. There was too much ambient noise when they were filming on location. But regardless, with, regardless of how that sound got captured, to give that sense of chaos, but still have, as Greta Gerwig put it, certain voices or phrases peek out at the viewer so that we can hear what we need to for that, for that scene uh, is a real, real challenge. And the fact that this film pulls it off is a testament to its quality. I had said to my students that I wanted them to pay attention to how well the movie frames the shots with all four sisters in it. So from a camera shot perspective, but I think insofar as sound, the movie is also very successful in framing all four of the, these women without losing any one of them. There are also a number of wonderful sound bridges or what we call overlapping sound in the film where as uh, there's that one sequence where they're when they're when they're in their childhood and they're they're enjoying this time at the beach and we hear joe quoting while well, she's reading from a book by george eliot and the quote is we could never have loved the earth so well if we had no childhood in it and this comes right at the middle point of the movie and i think it's it's like a, it's almost like a thesis statement for the film, sitting right in the middle of it, that our childhood informs the people we become, that the childhood of these women informs the, or the childhood of these girls informs the women they become. And I love those sound bridges. I love those moments of overlapping sound. They're done so well in this film. Uh, almost all sound in one way or another is operating as, as a sound bridge because of all the edits that are happening in a movie. Again, when I was when I was young and I would film with my my video camera and we we wouldn't do the sound over later. We just edited up what we had and you'd go from a really windy shot to a shot with no wind and so it's like and then nothing. And you're aware that the edits it just happened. If you've got a sound bridge, you're not aware of those edits. Sound smooths out the chop. And it can also smooth out, as it does many times in this movie, the shift from one timeline to the other. There are many points in this movie where, in my first viewing of it, I had to stop and think, okay, is this the past or is this the now? Is this childhood or is this adulthood? And the sound bridges were, are a way in which this movie does this. But I, I think it's, it's brilliant the way that, that the movie ties it, ties it together. It gives it this tension between the past and uh, the present. One of the concepts of elemental systems that your textbook talks about in this chapter is narrative. Stories structured into acts that establish, develop, 
and resolve character conflicts. You might say, well, aren't all stories structured into acts that establish, develop, and resolve character conflicts? This gets a little messy, and I'm going to keep coming back to it over and over again until we get it, but it comes out of narrative theory. And it's the idea that there is a, there's a difference, at least in narrative theory, between how we use the word narrative and how we, how we use uh, story. So story is the, the things that actually happened and narrative is the way in which we tell it. So, you know, you might say it like this, like, let's say you get in a car accident and then someone says, what happened? you and your friends start to talk and the way in which you structure what happened becomes the narrative. The actual story was what occurred. And you can, and we sometimes refer to story in the way that I'm referring to here, especially when we're talking about film as plot. So story structured into acts is narrative. Story structured into acts that establish, develop, and resolve character conflicts. That's a narrative. And structuring a narrative, we learn this, uh, this structure in, in high school, I think. Many people do anyway, where we've got this rising action, right? We've got setting the scene and exposition, and then a problem comes along. And now there's this upward move uh, in rising action towards a climax. And then we get falling action and resolution and denouement. And this is a rudiment. This is a rudimentary structure. It is not the only narrative structure that exists. And we can see the failing of it or the way in which it cannot do everything we need it to in assessing how it works with this movie, with Little Women. Because if you were to take that narrative structure and use it with Louisa May Alcott's n novel, then you might be able to use that, that structure. But it doesn't work very well when we take the narratives of the four March sisters and try to apply it because we don't have just one story here. We have four. And I'm going to focus on one of these to illustrate this further. I'm going to, as I've already said, I love Florence Pugh as Amy. So Amy gets to be my... Uh, my example, my case study. When we first meet Amy in this version of Little Women, she's in Europe, she's in Paris, and she's learning how to paint. And she's with her aunt Josephine, played by Meryl Streep, and who's often called Aunt March in the in in this version. And Aunt March is devoted to ensuring that Amy marries well, that Amy marries in a way that will um, save her family's economic situation, that, that her family will be cared for. And, and this, this was, you know, this was a reality of the time and we could talk about all that and we would get lost in that discussion. That's really not where, where we want to be, but that's part of what's going on here. Um, that's part of what we could use as cultural analysis, although that gets, a, you know, we, we want to be careful about that, uh, simply because film always lies. And in as much as this movie is a period piece, it is all, also very much a modern movie. It is a modern movie. It is a version of Little Women created in the 21st century uh, by Greta Gerwig. And we want to keep that in mind as we, we think about those things. But anyway, coming back to Amy, at, you know, and so we're seeing Amy as a young woman, as an adult. And then the film takes us back to when Amy is a child. And she, you know, we, and if we, we, if we square up Amy in Paris with setting the scene and exposition, it works. But then if we go to the problem We've got Amy falling in love with Lori as a child. And that is, that is her problem. But this is not following a linear structure in, in a perfect way that, that coheres with this, you know, rising action sort of thing, because the, the action is moving around. And so then when it shifts back to Amy as adult in Paris, having this fight with Lori, the fact that she fell in love with him as a child informs that scene, but not in a way that maps perfectly onto this structure. So the nonlinear structure of the, of the film 
disturbs that. I can take all of that information and I can make it linear. I can say, well, first she falls in love with Laurie when she's really young and then she falls through the ice. But that's not the way that the movie organizes it. The movie organizes it in a, she's in Paris and she sees Laurie. And I love that. I love that shot. I love when she sees Laurie, the way that he walks by, the movie is already telling us they're in love. They're, or she's in love with him and they belong together. If this was if this was just Amy's movie, we would be like, oh, yeah, they're going to end up together at the end of the movie. The way in which Greta Gerwig plays with the narrative forces us to assume that Joe is going to end up with uh, Lori. And we'll talk more about that in regards to expectations later. But then we move to her as a child. And then her and Laurie have this fight in Paris because he's being, you know, uh, he's, he's, he's drunk. He's got these two women on his arm. Um and she feels like he's he's wasting his life plus she's in love with him and she wishes she was with him and then we get her falling through the ice as a child and and that's the order in which some of the, the those are sequenced again that's not the order in which they happened in the novel i say happened with the air quotes up because none of this happened it's all made up um so you know when people do appeals to you know that's not how, what she would have really said i'm like well she's a fictional character and she'll say whatever the script demands of her um but we, we have this non-linear narrative and that that changes the way that we perceive this story see the, the louisa may alcott's novel has the same story as Greta Gerwig's film, but the way in which it is presented to us as narrative is distinct. So we've got a narrative, story structured into acts that establish, develop, and resolve character conflicts. And this movie is structured uh, with a frame narrative. Frame narrative is when we've got an, uh, literally a frame um, where the movie begins with Joe in the publishing publishing house talking to the, the, uh, the editor um, about having her book published and it ends more or less in the same way. I mean, we do get that wonderful shot, uh, of all of the sisters at, uh, Aunt Josephine's house, which uh, Joe inherits, but the, the, the movie begins with her wanting to be published and the movie ends with her being published. And so those bookend the movie, we've got this frame narrative and what happens in the middle is the story of these four sisters. And it's interesting to me that Saoirse Ronan was nominated for Best Actress and that Florence Pugh was nominated for Best Supporting Actress when I think that their, the weight of their stories is relatively similar. I haven't timed it out or, or you know gone through it shot by shot to see. Um, Joe is certainly front and center in, in many ways more than, than Amy is, but Amy's not far behind. Um, but there are so many shots in, in the film, as I said before, where they're working with all four actresses at the same time, uh, sometimes in moments of chaos. And that's, that's really amazing to me whenever the actors can all hit their mark and stay where they need to. And the camera captures all of that. But it's, it's also this shift back and forth, and this brings us back to mise-en-scene, but it's also about cinematography, um, because, and I don't know if you picked up on this, but there is a different color scheme for the two different timelines. The past is warm. It's got more uh, oranges and reds. And the present is cold. It's more blue. And... I think that says something about the the way in which we perceive memory. Uh, I think it says something about the way, at least, that Greta Gerwig wants to say that these characters are perceiving their memories of childhood, that there are these warm memories of a time when things were, were perhaps simpler, more joyful. Uh, adulthood is hard, at least in Little Women. And I think the best example of, of this is the reveal of Beth's death. So, spoiler alert, um, I don't know how you can have a spoiler with a book that's as old as Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, but whatever. These are identical shots of, we, it, 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 this whole sequence starts with these identical shots of Joe with her eyes closed. And you can see, if you compare those side by side, that you know we've got the warm one in the past and the cold in the present. And if you go through the sequence, 
uh, the entire sequence, you've got uh, the, the first run at it is in the past when Joe is young and Beth is first sick. It's when she's first gotten sick, uh, not later when she, you know, there's, there's, uh, the, when everything has gotten worse. And we're looking here again at editing. We've got editing the juxtaposition of individual shots to create a sequence. We've got shots, which are those individual moments, the product of one interrupted run of the camera, and then a sequence, which is where we edit all the shots together, unified by a theme or purpose. And I love the purposefulness of this sequence. So Joe wakes up. She dashes out of the room because the bed is empty. She's been caring for her sister. She's been caring for Beth, who's been sick. And now Beth's not there. So she runs down the stairs. And when she gets to the bottom of the stairs, she's, she's tears in her eyes. And we as the audience know how we're supposed to feel here right now. We're supposed to feel just like Joe. And we are as worried for Beth as Joe is. Because let's face it, Eliza Scanlon plays Beth so well that by this point in the film, we are just, we, we, don't, we, cannot, we cannot stand to lose her. And, um, and, and the wonderfully framed shot of Laura Dern as Marmy, their mom, who is sitting in front of Beth. We don't see Beth right away from Joe's perspective because we've got um, Laura Dern in the way. And then she, she sits back and I love Eliza Scanlon's expression as Beth here, like what seems to be the problem. And then we have Joe, her reaction, beautiful smile on her face. And then she runs over and she gives her this crushing hug. And that, that whole sequence is just lovely. Right. And then that moves from that sequence to and we we start now we can start the the other sequence where we have Joe waking up again same shot uh as Joe looks at the bed and sees it empty but now this is in the present day and we've got that cool color palette so we know the difference other other little differences right like costuming tells us the difference but there's that subtle difference in the way that these shots have been lit and the way in which filters are being used um, so then she dashes out of the room, runs. She, this time she doesn't run down the stairs, so she walks carefully down the stairs as though she's already accepted what has happened. And what I think is brilliant about this sequence is that if we don't know the story of Little Women, maybe we hope. I'm actually getting a little choked up as I think about this because I think that this scene is absolutely brilliant. I think it's so powerful. And the first time that I saw it, I was just hammered by it because I was having this double experience of watching what was happening. And as I said, I've never read Little Women. I never saw the 1990s movie. This is my first experience of Little Women. Was This version is my first experience of Little Women. And, and there's a part of my brain that's going, oh my God, I hope she's not dead. And that first time through, she's not. But now this second time through, with that resignation perhaps on, on, on Saoirse Ronan's face, we get the same perspective, but this time Laura Dern as Marmy is not turning and looking and going, well, whatever could be the problem. She's turning and she's got this look on her face of devastation because she's just crushed at the loss of her child. And we get Joe's reaction, which is sorrow before she comes. And in contrast to the crushing hug that she gave her sister before... She now stands in front of her mother who just just holds on to her. People regularly say to me that I ruin movies for them. They say, Dr. Prashan, you ruin movies for me. They're, they're never, you know, I'm always analyzing them now. And I was analyzing this while I was watching it. I'm analyzing it right now. I've seen this movie I don't know how many times. Why am I still crying? Because I'm just a big softie. That, but also I cry when I hear great singing and I cry when I, I'm brought to tears might be the best way to say it in the presence of great art. And I think that this sequence is a masterful use of cinematography, cinematography, the process of lighting, framing and capturing images. And this sequence shows us how in, 
in twice in the film we we get the same framing but different lighting right to juxtapose these two moments in joe's life and that is mediated to us through cinematography in conjunction with editing and we move from these sequences and we want to know about the the way in which these sequences are working so we've got the, the individual shots that make up the sequences that are represented here and in the in, and individual scenes that are complete units complete units of plot action this whole thing is a sequence we could say that that each of these each of these sets of you know joe running down the stairs and finding beth alive and then Joe running down the stairs and finding Beth uh, has died, that each of those are sequences. We could, we could talk about them as sequences. But uh, we could also talk about them as scenes and the entire thing as a sequence, which is tied together almost unfairly. This is incredible emotional manipulation, and, and as such, it's genius. Um, where we move from the revelation, the film moves from the revelation that Beth is not dead, Joe gives her this crushing hug and then we get the scene of the father coming home and now we've got that emotional hit of oh good he's safe he's not dead he didn't die in the war he's home the actors do such a good job of being so joyful at being reunited that you can't help but be a bit joyful at being reunited unless you you know have no heart um and then we get this the sequence or the scene where Joe comes down and finds that her sister has died, that Beth has died. And then we get the funeral. And this was what really, really struck me. I was just floored by this. Look at the color in the shot after Beth has died, after Joe and Marmy have embraced. And it cuts to the funeral. And what do we have there? We have a, a blurring, a blending of the past and the present in the color palette. There is warmth in the sunlight peeking through the trees. And there is cold in the forest all around. Now, we come back to forms and expectations at this point because we when we're watching a movie, we'll instinctively search for a pattern. We look for patterns in all art forms. You throw up a sequence of circles in a certain array, and it might look like Mickey Mouse's head, when really all you were doing was a really bad Venn diagram. Uh, patterns provide an element of structure, and films are filled with patterns. At least good films are filled with patterns. And Little Women really shows that in spades in this particular in this particular sequence that we just discussed. But we also have forms and expectations in regards to Joe and Lori's relationship. We can spend the movie mostly expecting that Joe and Lori are going to get together and that anything that, that Lori has with Amy is just sort of a dalliance, but he's really going to get back to her because that's how true love works or something like that. Or maybe you're team Amy with me, I don't know. Um, but I think the movie is, is structured in such a way that we expect Joe and Lori to get together. Even though we know that Joe turned him down from the very start of the film. One of the first things that Amy says is that I'm sorry that Joe turned you down. We know this already. What I think is brilliant about this film is that there's a number of things that we know before we see the resolve. And even when we see the resolve, we still can feel the emotional weight of it that we're still emotionally crushed for lori in some way when when joe turns him down and these expectations are built out of potentially watching a lot of romance movies that perhaps we watch a lot of romantic films or romantic comedies and so we have an expectation and, and joe just seems like she ought to get together with lori because isn't that the way that things should be but if you go back and look at the way that Greta Gerwig shoots the scenes between Amy and Laurie, this movie is driving towards their kiss in a way that makes it 
very satisfying. When, when that happens, when that finally happens, it's not, well, no, he's supposed to get together with Joe. Although we might still feel that way simply because we can't, we can't check our feelings. We can't take our subjectivity completely out of the equation. There's always a little bit of that hiding in the wings. And, and we maybe we identify strongly with Joe. And so we go, but I want Joe to get together with Lori, you know, because we, we really want that to happen. But the movie is setting, the movie is setting them up from, from very early on. The way in which it's shot, the way we first see Lori walking in slow motion. That's Amy's perspective. She sees Lori and time slows down, right? So... We might have expectations about how that comes out, but that's that might just be us emotionally connecting to the characters. That's not necessarily what the film is doing. And when we start to do formal analysis, we can pick up on some of those things and anticipate where the movie is going to go. And some people think that's that's bad because it will ruin the movie. But if all you go to movies for is to, you know, be shocked or surprised, you know, like, don't tell me how it ends, I hate spoilers, then you're only ever going to get that out of those films. And there's so much else to get from a movie. That's why we can watch them over and over again. And formal analysis enriches our repeat viewings. Um, once we know that Joe is not going to be together with Laurie, we enter a sequence of the film that supports the part of your textbook that talks about the, one of these fundamentals of film form, that movies depend on light, that movies provide an illusion of movement and that movies manipulate space and time in unique ways. This sequence where Joe begins to write Little Women effectively, this, this wonderful blending and blurring of Louisa May Alcott's life and her character's uh, experience. That in a way, Joe becomes Louisa May Alcott in these in these in these scenes. At first, she's just going to burn everything, and then she looks at the 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 things that she had started to write for Beth, and she begins work on her novel in earnest. And we get repetitions. You want to talk about patterns? We get all sorts of patterns in this sequence where the matches keep coming into the 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 camera frame to show her lighting a candle over and over again. That's telling us that time is going by. But it's not going by in real time. There are movies and TV shows that have been made where they try to do a real time thing. Movies, uh, TV shows like 24. But mostly movies condense time. Sometimes they'll stretch it. Lori walking in slow moment, slow motion is a is a is a stretching. But there's a lot of condensing, and this final sequence condenses the work that Joe engages in to craft. Her novel and the way that this sequence is done really highlights how light is used as well because we get daylight we get nighttime we get the use of candles all over the room to you know to show us how long she's been working on this candles burning down telling us something about that all visual motifs to tell us that time is elapsing is elapsing and the sequence is, is great for for studying uh, this idea of movies depending on light, movies providing an illusion of movement, and manipulating space and time in unique ways. Your textbook also talks about realism and anti-realism. Realism being the tendency to view or represent things as they really are. And I would argue that film almost never represents things as they really are, but almost always is cheating simply because the frame of the camera can't take in reality. We don't get peripheral vision in film. You take a photo, you're making sure that you're framing it in just such a way. I've told this story many times to my students, but when I was, uh, we, were, we were taking photos at Christmas this one year and I broke one of my toes walking into the photo. My sister had a, uh, a, a couch, I guess, made out of the heart of a dead star. It was so dense. And when my foot collided with it, it didn't move at all, but my bones did. And I heard the crack and I felt that, uh, that electric sort of bright white pain. And now I got to walk into this, this, this family photo with my son held in my arms and smile for the camera. Well, there are 20 photos or so of me grimacing in pain. And there are two where I'm smiling. Now, the one where I'm smiling, suitable for framing. Somebody looks at that photo and they go, oh, that's a beautiful shot. And I'm like, I just broke my toe. Well, you'd never know. Why? Because the camera doesn't represent things as they really are. It frames, it cuts. We capture a moment, right? Anti-realism and an interest in or concern for the abstract, speculative, or fantastic. Some films don't care about being realistic. 
And these moments when the actors turn to the camera are moments of slight anti-realism. They're still in their costumes, but they're speaking to the camera. And we as the audience know they're speaking to the camera. And I find this jarring. Not in a, it knocked me out of the film kind of way, but just in a, oh, that was interesting. That's an interesting shift. Uh, you know, what's going on there? Um, it's because that's when letters were being written, right? Letters are being written. And so rather than having the voiceover of the person who's gotten the letter, we get the, the person speaking directly to us, almost as though that's the way that Joe or uh, whomever is being spoken to um, is, is receiving that information. We get that again near the end of the, the film, and, and there's this wonderful, again, blending and blurring of Louisa May Alcott's life and her character's uh, story with Joe getting together with Professor Bear at the very end of the film. And that's cross-cut. We talk about cross-cutting as, as a form of editing. We get cross-cutting here between Joe going to the station to meet, to, to, to get him before he leaves. A, a convention of the romance genre, right? You got to run to the airport and get the girl or the guy before they get on the plane and they're out of your life. Uh, but she goes to the station even as we are learning that she has having this conversation with the publisher about making sure that her character gets married. And if you know anything about the life of Louisa May Alcott, you will know that she did not want Joe to get married at the end of the book. So Greta Gerwig includes that here. And I, I, I think it's just genius. It's absolute genius. It's not necessarily true to uh, Little Women as, as a novel, but it's true to Little Women as this bigger concept and Louisa May Alcott as part of that. Uh, it's really, really great because it's, it's a way, the way in which the film is playing with ideas of realism and uh, anti-realism uh, with uh, verisimilitude, we might say. Um, it still feels real because of the way that the film handles it. Speaking of verisimilitude, um, which is the convincing appearance appearance of truth, not the same as realism. Okay, a convincing appearance of truth, not the same as realism. Which convinces you that you are really there by being internally consistent. So when we watch a superhero movie, for example, and we know that people can't really have claws come out of their hand, metal claws coming out of their hand, but Wolverine does in the X-Men, and there's a consistency to the way in which the films treat him having his claws come out of his hand so that when it does, we don't go, you would slice all the tendons in your hand. We don't think about that because there's this internal consistency with the verisimilitude of that particular film or film series or film genre. And this, this concept of verisimilitude is affected by time and culture as audiences' expectations of reality change. You remember when we were talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark and the idea of having somebody get their you know, their head shot from the front and you get this big gory. Um, that was not a convention in 81. Um, prosthetic makeup coming in into its own. Once upon a time, the convention for gunshots in movies was just somebody went Pow! and then you'd see someone go uh, and you wouldn't see blood. But now conventionally, we expect to at least see something, some kind of debris. If it's not blood, you know, if they want it to be PG and they don't want to gore all over the place. Um, but we expect to see some of that. And that is an expectation that we as audiences have today that previous audiences would not have. And I think about this in regards to the production design for Joe's costuming. It is coded so very masculine over and over and over again. And it would be interesting to do a comparative study with other Joes, with Winona Ryder's Joe from the 1990s film, with Joe from any other, any other adaptations of Little Women. What was the costuming like for her? And how is it distinct from what uh, the production design in Greta Gerwig's Little Women does? How is it different? Right? Because that, that isn't particularly realistic for the time. Now somebody might come back, back at me and say, well, no, there were, there were women who did. Yep, yeah, for sure, there were. But they were rare. And I think that's, that's Gehrig's point here is that Joe is rare. And Joe dances to her own fiddle, as it were. She's, she's setting her own course. And the way that she dresses is one more way in which that 
is being communicated to us as viewers. But I don't think that this would have worked in previous iterations of Little Women in the way that it does now. Because culturally, we are here. We accept this. There's a, there's a different way of thinking about women and agency and the way in which we dress, the way that we, we present ourselves in the world, ideas of sexuality and gender, that Gerwig's Joe, Ronan's Joe embody that would not have necessarily worked, that would not have had a sense of verisimilitude in other times. So that changes over time. But this is ultimately Greta Gerwig's Little Women. In the same way that when we get to looking at Fellowship of the Ring, we're not looking at Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. That's a book. Louisa May Alcott's Little Women is a book. Greta Gerwig's Little Women is a movie. And it is a very particular movie, a very particular art form that is looking not only at adapting Little Women, but also at expressing something about, as Gerwig has put it, women and art. That Amy being in Paris and being a painter is just as important as Amy's growing up and falling in love with Laurie. That Joe getting published and having a book is just as important, if not more, than her relationship with Professor Bear. Gerwig has created a very particular narrative of the story of Little Women in film form and made it as a distinct work of art with its own ideas. So, moving, thinking about uh, you know where we're going to go from here. Uh, next week, we're looking at The Shape of Water, uh, a distinct work of art. We want to look at it on its own. You may have seen other Del Toro movies. You may have seen other movies that are similar to this one. What we want to do is look at it on its own terms. What does this movie want to tell us? What does this movie want to say? What does this movie want to do to our emotional landscape? Um, so thanks again for being with me today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to know that people are out there listening to this or watching it. And, uh, and if you haven't seen Little Women, I just can't recommend it enough. Uh, I didn't say this last week with Raiders of the Lost Ark because maybe you haven't seen Raiders of the Lost Ark and I'm not really invested in making sure that you do. Uh, it's it's a little old, and uh, but, but Little Women, this is just a really, really powerful movie. I think it's excellent. I think it's one of the best films of 2019. And, uh, and, I, and I do think that it got a little cheated at the, the Oscars, but that's just me. That's just me. Uh, again, I'm Mike Pershawn. I've been your host here on Triple Bladed Sword or if you're watching this on YouTube, my Doc Pershawn channel. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week for Shape of Water.